Hello, welcome to Life Questions. I'm your host, Bill Harris. We're happy that you joined us today, and we certainly hope to have answers to the questions about life that you have sent us. We're joined today by a panel of local ministers who are here, and they are armed with biblical insights for your questions after much prayer and careful research. So I'd like you to meet them at this time. Joining us are Pastor Bob Warren of Shekinah Temple Church in St. Mary's, followed by Pastor Patrick Kamler of Westminster Christian Church. Then there's Pastor Greg Fox of Bluffton Trinity United Methodist Church, as well as Lawson New Hope uh, United Missionary, uh, United uh, Methodist Church, I'm sorry. Getting my denominations mixed up. Not a problem. <laughs> Rounding our panel, Pastor Mark Bird. He is the state chairman of Revive Ohio. We're happy to have you all with us. You know, I just got through doing a stint with um, Christian Missionary Alliance churches. There were two of them, and I, I, I almost intertwined that into to you guys. Anyway, we're happy to have you with us today. Now, we have been, we're blessed because we've had um, the privilege of having um, some uh, input from the um, Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And these young teenagers have been writing us questions that they have about the Bible. Last week, we uh, went into some of those questions and we thought, well, why not continue again this week because the questions are so well. Some of these questions, gentlemen, as you know from uh, researching them, uh, have to deal with the authenticity of the Bible and God and the like. One thing, uh, one question is asked here, three words, is Jesus God? Right. That was just one question. Why, why don't you start off, Pastor Bird? Sure. And uh, the thing I love about these questions is they're real and they're honest, right? These are real yeah. questions that, that we get asked all the time, uh, literally on the street. But uh, it, it, the question is, is Jesus God, right? And uh, of course, we always go to the scripture on that. And uh, John chapter one, in the very beginning, uh, verse one, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. That's verse one of John one. And then skipping down to verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. So we know that the word was God, right? And the word is described here as Jesus because Jesus uh, became flesh and came to the earth. And so we know that that's spelled out there that Jesus is God. He went on in John chapter eight and he said, you know, before Abraham was, I am. And so language, when, isn't it? yeah, exactly. And so it's interesting that uh, when God identified himself to Moses out of the burning bush and, G and, and Moses said, well, hey, uh, God, who do I tell the people that you are? And his response was, I am, right? I am that I am. And so this is the one and the same. Yeah. And so I think for me, the word clearly defines that. And again, uh, one of the things that the Pharisees questioned Jesus about because he was forgiving men their sins yes. while he trouble. was on earth. And then yeah. they said, according to, this, to the law, right, the only person that can forgive sins is God himself. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's another personification of, uh, of proof of who Jesus was. Yeah. Now, yeah, um, as, as I said before, when he started forgiving sins, he got himself into a lot of trouble there with the, with the Pharisees. And in terms of the authenticity uh, of God, when we look at the fact that he became, uh, became uh, uh, flesh and blood, yep. what is the significance of God up there sending his son down here to become flesh and blood? Why would he do that? What's the significance? So he could be a faithful high priest. The word says he was tempted in all points as we were yeah. and yet without sin. So he, you know, he put on, he took on flesh so he would understand the temptations and stuff that we as mankind goes through. Yeah. And even, even with the teenagers, for instance, that, that have asked these questions, how would we relate that to them? He became flesh and blood for them because... You know, uh, what would it's, you say? It's, it's strictly, and the way I look at it is a, as an example. Who do you follow easier? Someone who proclaims something or someone who's walked in your shoes, knows what you're going through, mm -hmm. has experienced the experiences that you have. You know, if someone says, well, prove to me it's real, what more real can you be when, when Jesus walked in our own shoes? As Bob said, has our temptations has our needs, our wants, everything involved. He was a human being and still 
walked perfectly on the earth in his father's image. Can we run into that? It was that desire for, for love and for relationship that God has with us, that relationship that was, that was fractured in the Garden of Eden. And God decided that he could, well, there's any number of ways that you could restore people back to you. You could, you could threaten them. You could say, you could show up in a cloud and go, I'm God, <laughs> worship me, you know, and you could approach that way. But God, Jehovah didn't approach it that way. He sent himself in the form of his son, Jesus Christ, in bodily form for all the things that we, we've talked about, but humbled himself to not just being a human, but humbled himself to a point that he died one of the most horrific and lowly deaths that you could possibly have gone through at that point in time, which is death on a cross, because of his love for us. And that, that's something that gets, I think, lost in the shuffle a lot of times when we're talking about what it means to be a Christian, what it means to follow God, is that there's this list of do's and don'ts and things like that. No, it's recognizing that a, an, an eternal being loved us, you, me, so very much that he took the form that we have in a way that we could understand, in a way that we could relate to, came down, brought himself down to our level so that we could be lifted up. The mm -hmm. divine became human so that humanity could become divine. You want to add to that? I just uh, just know that, you know, he's just like he said earlier in the other program, but in 1 Corinthians 10, there's no temptation taking you, but just such as common unto man and God will make a way of escape. God will make a way of escape because he's been there and he's experienced it. So he will be there and give you the, the way out when we're tempted. You know, a very basic fundamental question I think these teens have written in. Um, are the stories in the Bible really true? Um, some of them seem kind of unrealistic. I do, think, I do think that there are some things about life today that are unrealistic too out there, but nonetheless, this is their, from their vantage point. You know, are, are, are there, um, is there truth in these stories? And because some of them seem unrealistic. Well, many of these questions, I, I, always, I always want to approach it kind of from the rabbinic tradition of answering a question with a question. Because I'd like to know, you know, even with the Jesus, is Jesus God question, it's like, oh, well, uh, what, what do you think about him? You know, what, who do you say he is? And with mm -hmm. kind of the stories in the Bible, I, I, I'd like to know kind of specifically what, what stories are you referring to? And what element do you think perhaps is, is true or untrue? Because I think that that's a wide topic to really get into. Because again, and I alluded to mm -hmm. in the last show, there's, there's this idea of historicity, historicity of these stories and of things in Scripture and even about God himself that have kind of changed what we think should be factually accurate within the last couple hundred years or so. That's not to make excuses to say that the Bible's not true, or the stories aren't true or anything like that. That's not even where I'm going with this. It's what we would deem as factually accurate may not necessarily line up with the, the stories in the Scripture. For Just to give you maybe a quick example on this. If the timeline in one of the reigns of the kings of Israel was off by a year or two, does that mean that the entire story is false? Well, no, of course not, because the people that are writing the stories at the time think that, well, it's really not important to know specifically when the dates were. It's more important to realize that this king was really evil mm -hmm. or this king was really good in the mm -hmm. cases of guys like Hezekiah, Josiah, things like that. The aspect of the story, what the story is trying to teach and the big information that's trying to get across, that's what matters as far as whether it's true or not. Getting kind of lost in like the little minutia of the dates and, and, and things like that, I think is where you can kind of get sidetracked. And again, not that I'm saying that the Bible has that messed up at all, but a lot of times when we're asking that kind of question, we have seen something at some point where it's like, well, I, I read in this where, you know, Hezekiah's reign was actually from this date to this date. It wasn't for what the Bible says and, and things like that is kind of where it gets, uh, and uh, we can get a little too lost in the weeds of details where mm -hmm. we don't really need to. Yeah. Well, and, and talk about getting lost in the weeds. Here's another question though. Where was Jesus for the three days between his death and his resurrection? Um, do you want to take that on? Sure, I absolutely will. The scripture tells us in Peter that uh, he actually went to hell and preached down there, right? Mm -hmm. And again, that's not necessarily a uh, popular teaching, but the scriptures yes. definitely tell us that. Yes. That's what he was doing. And he also said in Luke chapter 4, he came 
to set the captives free, mm -hmm. right? Realize that Jesus' mission on earth and God anointed him to do such, and we've talked about that already, but his mission was to set the captive free. And that and, was in Peter, first Peter, second yeah. Peter? What, what? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure oh, of okay. the exact reference on that, but okay. that's where, uh, that's what he did. Yep, yeah, I'll have to, I'll have to right. look that up. All right, uh, let, let's go on to the next question then. Um, well, you know, the significance, I, I just thought of something. If Christ went to hell for us, we need not go. Right. And, and, I, and I think about the people who very often will ask this question. How can such a loving God send anybody to hell? In point of fact, he's not sending anybody to hell. He's already sent his son there for us. Right. If anybody goes to hell, it's because they choose to because... He's already sent his son there. That's right. Yeah. And I, I think that's simply yes. put for uh, young people to understand that. And then what about, um, here's another question that they ask. How do you prove Christ's resurrection? There's that word prove there. How do you prove Christ's resurrection? And um, is that something we need to prove? Or as some ministers would say, I wasn't there. Those of us who are alive today and believe in Christ were not there. However, we believe it by faith. This is a, this is a, it's a belief system. It, it, it operates by faith. It's not having to see the tangible proof, but believing it. Well, and, and that's right. And there, again, there is a faith, there is a faith system to it. I, I could be, I've been known to be a little bit of a smart aleck from time to time. And, and, <laughs> Again, no. from one <laughs> shock. Everyone at this table is absolutely shocked by that. But I, I could equally go, okay, well, sh show me he didn't. You know, show me the body. Let's go to his grave and you show me that he didn't come back from the dead. But again, kind of with the other question, I, I want to know what is kind of driving this particular question. Like, why are we, why are we looking for this? Because it, it, it is very much dealing with... Um, spiritual aspects of it because because Christ was resurrected bodily we can be not only resurrected spiritually and find spiritual life where before we were dead in our sins and in our trespasses but we could also look forward to a time when we will be resurrected bodily that death is just mm -hmm. sleep for the person who is in Christ That's they're true. just a uh, the, it's just a temporary situation that they're in that they will at one point be with God so I guess trying wanting to i guess understand kind of where that particular question is coming from because like i said the the flip side of it is is also accurate you know show me he didn't you know mm -hmm. show me where his body is and if you show me where his body is then we can have that discussion well you can't because there isn't one because it's not because it's not there but it it goes more i think into what what are we really searching for are we are we willing to take a posture of there's a lot of things that I don't quite understand. It's entirely possible that just because, and again, this kind of goes back to the historical correction that we were talking about earlier. That doesn't mean that because we're so hung up on facts and dates and things like that now, it means that we're getting it right today. It doesn't mean that, oh, well now we know what we're talking about Hundreds of years ago when they were writing history down, they had no idea what we're talking about. That's very, uh, very arrogant of ourselves to think that because we have all this information, we have all this technology now that we've got it down. We probably, probably don't. Kind of Monday, uh, Monday morning quarterbacking. Now. Hmm. In, in yeah. some sense, yeah. Yeah, yeah certainly. Sense, yeah. Okay. Well, if you look at that question as a whole, if you step back and look at it, look at God's plan. Okay? He sent Jesus, you know, and it tells us in the Bible that our wages for sin or death, okay? Jesus paid that wage for us by going to hell, by dying on the cross. Mm -hmm. And then if you're a sinner and you lose your life and you go to eternal death, where do you go? You go to hell, right? Jesus went to hell for us. Mm -hmm. Now, G the Lord promises us eternal life. If he didn't bring Jesus back because he was a sin-free man and allow him to, to ro be resurrected and, and ascend into heaven, then the story would end there and we would not have the ability to rise up and go to heaven be because our sins are forgiven and we receive God's grace mm -hmm. and that Jesus already paid for our sins. Very good. 
Good point. Let, let, let's continue on this in a few more minutes. We're uh, past time on a break. We'll be right back. Do not go away. <laughs> Don't go away, there's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastures you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pasture suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now back to the discussion. Thank you for staying with us and we're back now and keep in mind we're dealing with some questions that have come in to us from the Fellowship of Christian Athletes and these are teenagers. Another one of the uh, questions that we're dealing with is how do I know I'm saved? Brother Bob? Romans uh, 10 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you made the right with God and by confessing with your mouth, you are saved. As the scripture tell us, anyone who trusts in him will not be disgraced. Jew and Gentile are the same, and this is with respect. They have the same Lord who generously, who gives generously to all that call on him, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now does that mean when we get saved, we expect that there will be a bolt of lightning and there's all no. kind of thunder rolling? No, yes. that no. <laughs> sorry, I mean, no, no, it doesn't happen. <laughs> So it's a matter of belief. It's something that you feel assured of and reassured of on the inside. You're shaking your head. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm taken to first John chapter five, uh, verse 13 says, these things I've written to you who believe in the name of the son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God, mm -hmm. so that you know and that you continue in His ways. Yeah. I think that is the, the blessed assurance that we yeah. sing about, uh, and that's how we can know. And I think one of the things we learn as, as we're Christians, there are indeed some mornings you get up and you don't necessarily feel Christian, do you? Right. I, I, I mean, I don't think you, I'm not saying you want to rob, rob a bank or something like that, but, but you just don't feel Christian. You don't feel yeah, saved, yeah. you know? What were you going to say? I was going to say, sometimes I feel like robbing a bank. No, I, I, I don't ever really. Well, that's yeah. a confession, I tell you. <laughs> um, that's a whole other show. That's a whole other show. show. <laughs> Tune in next week, folks. We've got a, we've got a humdinger for you. Um, and I think the, that's important to know, like because you, you want to have that blessed assurance that you talked about. But also what is great about that is as you go on and as you develop a deeper relationship with Christ, you start to to move in different places. And hopefully you get you get beyond the, you know, am I saved question and you start to go into the, you know, what what does God what does God want of me today? You know, when you have those mornings where you wake up and you, you don't really feel like doing much of anything good, let alone for mm -hmm. God, you, you have those moments where you can, you know, you can you can draw closer to the throne of grace because we we have that we have that high priest for us. And just understand, you know, who God wants us to be. It, it's not in many ways, it, it's not that much different from, you know, when you first get married. It's like when you first get married, like, how do you know? Well, there's a ring and there's a ceremony and mm -hmm. there's a picture of someone and you got your license in the air. And you're like, look, we're married, that kind of thing. I've been married for eight years. I haven't hold, held up my, I don't even know where my marriage license is. I think it's somewhere in the house. But we, we I don't rely on that to show that I'm married mm -hmm. or to prove that I'm married. Mm -hmm. I just know that, well, I, I have a light wife that I love very much and she loves me. And yeah, I wear a wedding ring, but I don't take this off and she disappears. You know, I'm, I'm still married and it's that relationship that we've developed over years and will continue to develop over years. And with, and with God, I mean, it's not, there's not physical manifestations of that so much. It's more spiritual, but that premise still works where you understand more about who God is and are able to move forward knowing and in comfort in that security of who he is and who you are in him. Yeah, you know, there's a closely related question to that uh, for young people particularly, but uh, adults as well. And that is, you know, well, how do I know I'm saved when I'm when I first get saved? But what about when I've done something wrong, mm -hmm. and I have to ask God to forgive me? A am I saved then? Is is He going to take me back? Can I continue my Christianity? Well, yeah, that's that's something not just teenagers, but all struggle with. Yes, yes. You know, and, and we joked a minute ago about when you're saved, you get this bolt of lightning. I really believe, though, and at least it's true in my case, when you did become saved, 
you get a warming, you get a total different feeling of who you are and what you're doing. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm a good example when you ask, you know, I've done terrible things. How can, how can God forgive me for what I've done wrong? You know, my history is, is very long. Um, but the thing is, a sin is a sin is a sin to Jesus Christ. If you steal a piece of candy, that's a sin. If you murder someone, that's a sin. You know, if God can forgive somebody for murdering, how can he not forgive us for not doing the right thing all the time? Yeah. If he can forgive, you know, if he can forgive Paul who's in prison, who, who was killing Christians and, and, and still give him the, the life-saving fact that he even continued his ministry in prison as he was being persecuted. Yeah, wrote nearly half the New Testament. Correct, <laughs> and did that. That's the type of feeling I'm talking about. That's that lightning bolt that we keep saying, no, it doesn't yeah. really happen. Yes, it does. I mean, you get that once you know Jesus Christ and he comes into your life, you can't hold it back. You yeah. cannot hold it back. I think it's important too, and uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, we walk by faith and not by sight. And you know, we're not going by emotions, we go by what the Word of God says. And if we sin, if we fall short of the glory of God, you know, we confess our sins, 1 John 1, 9, we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And realize there's nobody perfect, the only perfect one they nailed to a cross. And uh, when you stumble, you get back up. And, and, you know, the word says, draw near with the true heart. Don't put on a facade. Be real with God and say, hey, God, I messed up. I sinned. I fell short of your glory. I need your grace. I need your help now. I need your mercy. I need your love. Mm -hmm. And he's there to pour it out. Pastor Amen. Bird? I think uh, I want to tether off of what uh, Pastor Bob said as well, because this letter in 1 John one nine that was written, it was written to the church. And he's saying, um, you know, if we confess our sins, right? That, that scripture was written to the church, yeah. to believers. So that means that we will sin, right? <laughs> and every person has sinned, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So the truth is, if we confess that to God, right? And so I ask people this, I say, uh, you, especially Christians, I say, um, what advice would you give to someone that came to you and said, I've gone too far, I've sinned too many times, I've done too many wrong things. Mm. What counsel would you as a Christian give to that person? Would you not immediately say, oh no, God can forgive you no matter what it is, immediately. But then we as Christians, well, I can't, God can't forgive me because I should have known better, right? But the truth mm. is, is His blood enough to forgive us of all of our yeah. sins and to cleanse us yeah. from all unrighteousness, whether it was yesterday, today, yeah. or tomorrow? Yeah. yeah, is there enough power in the blood That's to right. deal with That's it? That's what know? it boils down to. You, you touched on that a, a moment ago. Um, I've done some pretty bad stuff, so can God forgive me? Um, how, did you, how did you manage to overcome that to know that no matter how bad I've done, I don't, God I don't know that I overcame it. Mm -hmm. um, I had those questions. I had those doubts. But when I finally just got on my knees and, and gave up and said, God, I can't do this anymore without you. He's the one who let me realize that, that I'm okay. I'm mm -hmm. okay. I made mistakes, but it's okay. Mm -hmm. He's there to take those mistakes away. And you cannot do it on your own. There is no way you can make right what you've done wrong without the grace of God. And he will reach down and put you in his hands. And that's one thing I always tell people. You know, you hear a lot of people say, reach your hand out and grab God. I ask you, please don't grab a hold of God because you can let go. Yeah, yeah. Reach out, let him grab a yeah. hold of you, and he'll never let go. <laughs> right. I've heard a lot of the, the old folks in the church who, who use that same saying. That, that's true. Hey, don't put me in that category. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> No, that, that's, that's all right. Um, it, it go just ahead. Just to tie on that real quick, like what makes your sin so special right. that right. you think you can't be forgiven by God? Jesus forgave the people who nailed him to the cross. Mm -hmm. He forgave the, the repentant criminal that was hanging next to him on one of the other crosses. Jesus offers forgiveness. Uh, the, the son of Sam killer became a born again Christian in prison 30 wow. odd years ago. Wow. There is no one that's beyond the grace of Jesus, not even you. So... Your sin is not so great. Your sin is not so, you are not so special in your sin that you cannot be forgiven by the grace and the blood of Jesus. 
I, I like to look at it too. When he was on the cross, you know, the Bible said, he who knew no sin became sin. It was That's actually right. sin, sin hanging on the cross. And God the Father who is, um, who is reluctant to look upon sin, I mean, he is offended by it. He turned his back on his own right. son when he was on the cross. And that, that's what brought out the cry from Jesus. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Amen. God forsook his own son because he saw your sins, your sins, your sins, my sins, all on that cross. Well, Jesus, what, what Jesus began to realize was just the amount that sin actually separates from God. I, I don't know if it's so much that, that the father turned his face away. It's just that Jesus took on all the sin and realized, man, this is such a block from who God is and that when I have sin in my life, I, I can't see the Father and I don't recognize His presence in my life. And that's not any different with any of us. It's just we are not, we are not so close in to God that when we have sin in our life, we, we recognize it. Sometimes it takes that a while, but as we develop in that relationship, we'll find that there may, well, there may have been like years we go without confessing sin. And now it's like, oh, I realize I, I did something wrong. And you realize that you turn to him. That's a good thing because the Holy Spirit is working in your life and making you more uh, sensitive to the sin that separates and that trips you up and that you're more willing to go to God to ask for forgiveness. And he is right there accepting you and wanting to wash you clean and have you, have you repent and turn away. One thing, too, that, that perhaps young people are not thinking about is the fact that there's an old saying that, that uh, I used to hear when I was a teenager, because I got saved at age 15, and that is that youth begets youth. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times God wants to save young people so that they can in turn attract more young people. And uh, I, isn't that a bit of hope and encouragement for young people who are questioning whether or not God is really... Uh, interested in them in their it youth. It absolutely is. Yeah. yeah. And so that's exactly what God, we tell people that God has a divine purpose and a plan for every life, for every single life. God has a plan and a purpose. And his primary plan is to use each and every one of us, wherever we are, uh, in, in our jobs, in our school, in our activities, in all of our relationships, God wants to use us. And remember this in Matthew 5, Jesus looked at his disciples and said, you are the light of the world. Mm -hmm. Of course, we know that he is the light of the world, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But he looked at his disciples and he said, you are the light of the world. And he said, I need you to be the salt of the earth. And so our primary goal and calling and mission, if you will, Bill, yeah. is for God to save us so that we can help others see the light. Excellent. And on that note, we'll end it. Very well put. Very well put. And we uh, thank God for the young people of the, uh, the Fellowship of Christian Athletes who wrote in all of these questions. And we've been dealing with them today and on last week's program. And we thank you, fine ministers, for helping us. And certainly hope it's been a blessing to you young people as well as the uh, older people. <laughs> in our audience today. So the time we have, we'll be back again next week. Until then, I'm Bill Harris. Have a blessed day. Bye-bye. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at wtlw.com or call us with your thoughts. We're able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly life life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows, or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at WTLW.com. <laughs>